So, to see you all here on the panel, and I look very much forward to today's discussion. Uh, and now it is my great pleasure to give the floor to my co-chair today, Mr. Mantesia, Minister of Mineral Resources and Energy of South Africa. Minister, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, Co-Chairperson, uh, and uh, ministers and delegates to this uh, panel. Uh, I want to start off by uh, explaining my understanding of people-centered approach as encouraging us to appreciate that development gap between the various continents is going to be a, ma a major factor in dealing with this serious urgent task in our hands. Uh, we must appreciate that uh, when you are talking from Africa, you are not in Europe. Uh, and therefore, as you talk about climate change, you also faced with the reality of facing developmental challenges and reality of poverty inequality and unemployment in those uh, other continents. And therefore, we all agree that transitioning to cleaner, affordable, reliable, and more sustainable energy system has become increasingly a pressing issue, especially as part of a sustainable recovery effort emanating from COVID-19 pandemic. So we are not uh, putting up excuses not to do things because there's COVID-19 uh, pandemic. We say we must appreciate that we must adapt our programs and do more. Number two, as we embark on this effort, our collective approach must be one that is balanced, holistic, integrated, and inclusive, and very closely aligned to the sustained and shared economic growth and development that we all want. We must all position our collective responses to be realistic, viable, and have dedicated future-oriented perspective. Therefore, this panel, and indeed this summit, allow us to engage in a balanced discussion on some critical challenges, including opportunities and challenges of energy transition. And therefore, appreciate that transition implies a journey. Um, in a country like ours, where we're running a fleet of 16 coal generated power stations, it is not going to be a stroke of a pen to switch off all the 16 power stations and then move to renewables. Therefore, that journey of reducing carbon emission must be described uh, in a way that is uh, taking into account uh, challenging facing each country. The main levers for accelerated action and agreeing on what conditions are needed in all contexts to facilitate this change. And the technology, policy improvement, finance instruments needed to support energy transition and how to further develop and leverage the existing initiative in energy sector to drive the meaningful and just shift towards inclusive, lower carbon and resilient energy future. So, there is no debate about moving to lower carbon emissions. There is no debate about that. Everybody accepts that. Uh, where we should debate and be more realistic is how to navigate through that transition. Um, uh, I want to make the last point because I must leave time for discussions. Uh, is the fact that as we accept that the transition to more sustainable energy system entails declining share of, user, of, fuel, of fossil fuels in line with our national determined contribution and is demonstrated by our integrated resource plan and updated national determined contribution. This in turn places uh, at risk the people and communities dependent on fossil fuel uh, based industries, not only within the energy sector, but also complementary secondary sectors. I must make the point that the transition can only be meaningful if it accepts that as we close those power stations and those coal mines, there will be more challenges in those communities. 
and therefore diversify the economic development in those areas particularly. Uh, and therefore, I want to give you, as I, as I step down, does the, the contents of our plan in South Africa is that up to 2030, we plan to generate uh, 14,400 more megawatts from wind. We plan to generate 6,000 more megawatts from uh, solar. Uh, 2,500 from hydro, alternatively nuclear. 3,000 from gas, 2,088 from storage, and 1,500 from coal. And envisaged in that coal component is experiment with a cleaner coal technologies because it's an asset we have. And say, so how do we optimize our benefit from, from that asset? So I'm making that point and leaving it to the panel to help us think through these issues. And lastly, it would have been helpful if there was a detailed analysis of the uh, Texan latest experience and what lesson can we draw from it? Uh, that's it, thank you very much. I hand it back to my co-chairperson and the overall chairperson. Thank you so much, uh, Minister. Uh, you touch on many very important points. I think uh, definitely one of them is how do we make sure that the people that will lose their job in one sector gets employment in a different place? Because even though I think we all agree that there is a great uh, possibility in making a green transformation where you'll actually create more jobs than you will lose, how do we make sure that it's the same people that actually gets the jobs? Uh, now, coal mines, uh, you mentioned, uh, having having that challenge in, in South Africa. Uh, I read somewhere that there's around 7 million people working uh, in, in the coal industry in, in the world now. So that's 7 million families dependent on, on having a livelihood uh, uh, from coal. How do we make sure that in the green transformation that they are not uh, lost? Very, very important point. And therefore, it also gives me great pleasure to pass uh, the floor to my colleague, Minister Kurczuka from Poland, which is also a country uh, that, are, that are going through uh, a transformation, uh, moving away from, from coal, and that is doing it in a very ambitious and very uh, progressive way. Uh, Minister, the floor is yours. Uh, dear Minister, dear Dan, thank you very much uh, for giving me the floor. And uh, <clears throat> I'm very happy because uh, this is exactly the heart of uh, our strategy, uh, but also of what we started at COP24. And when we are preparing to COP26 in Glasgow, I think it is interesting to recall the experience of COP24, where the subject of just transition and putting people at the heart of this change uh, was really uh, very much underlined. And since then, uh, we experienced uh, an enormous change in uh, public acceptance here in my country, in Poland. Out of 40 million Poles in a recent uh, poll, 87% said they are willing to develop uh, new green energy with the support of state. 41% are even declaring that they are willing to pay more only a fraction being still attached to the old system. And uh, this is why, based on our experience of uh, extremely brutal and complex transition in the 90s and 2000s, which my country experienced in terms of closing mines, industries, etc., we uh, provided a plan, 20 years detailed, comprehensive, uh, coordinated plan, in order to synchronize decreasing share of coal going from 70 to 11% in 2040 with rising production from alternative sources of energy. This is why we want to be uh, developing offshore wind in the Baltic Sea uh, and having the lion's share of the seashore. It is a very interesting potential. We want to go for nuclear, no technology should be 
um, put uh, on the margin of this change. And we are experiencing a real boom in terms of prosumers. Half a million Poles are right now uh, having rooftop PVs and they are becoming active players in the energy market. Uh, and so this energy plan um, will, will work and is working because as Dan, you said, it is providing also new jobs for people in coal dependent regions. But our experience from this transition shows that it needs really to be gradual. It is sometimes extremely complicated to provide to people who are losing jobs in traditional sectors immediately a new job in another sector. So it must be a gradual transition for 20 years where uh, they can be assisted uh, in going, for example, for retirement, but their children will catch up a new job. This is why our energy plan provides 300,000 new jobs linked with uh, electric mobility, thermal modernization of up to 3 million Polish houses, uh, switching to nuclear, offshore, and uh, bottom-up uh, energy sources, as I said. For this, we need to develop technologies and we need international cooperation, such as is right now discussed at the International Energy Agency. We need to develop roadmaps for having critical mass in terms of financing also of new uh, technologies. And we need to protect the most vulnerable groups and the most vulnerable societies. And this must be our expression, not only domestically, but also on international scene in order not to leave anybody behind and not to expose uh, more uh, vulnerable countries, regions, social groups to unbearable risks uh, and costs of this transition. This would not be fair. And this, as I said previously, would not work. And putting at the heart of uh, our uh, transition, climate transition, just transition, I think is the right manner to address both our uh, planet concerns and uh, prosperity concerns for our people. Last but not least, we need to share know-how, we need to develop best practices. This is why in my country, after COP24, we have initiated Driving Change Together annual summit on electric mobility, and we are going to plan one at the end of the year as well, and we see already enormous benefits of betting on new technologies that we want to share with others. Poland is right now the biggest producer of lithium ion batteries in Europe, the biggest exporter of electric and hydrogen buses here in Europe as well. So we have uh, uh, also wealth of uh, opportunities and experience to be shared that we are willing to do so. All the best for this group, and we are will, uh, looking forward for COP26 in Glasgow in order to make it successful around people-centric transition. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michael. Uh, I, I very often, uh, I often say when I, I mention your name uh, to, to other colleagues that you probably have the most uh, difficult job in, in Europe, at least uh, the most difficult job being energy and climate minister, because you are going through a huge transformation, but but uh, you're really doing a good job. So thank you so much for sharing your experiences here with, with us also. I think it is an extremely important point that this is not a transformation that you can make overnight. Uh, this is a challenge because we are in a hurry. We need the green transformation to happen fast. But on the other hand, uh, to change whole communities, it's about the jobs, but it's also about the identity of people. And how, how do you make this uh, in a way that, that don't risk polarizing a population? In, in Denmark, we have some experiences also because we've decided to put an end date to oil and gas exploration in the, in the North Sea and, and cancel all future licensing rounds. This is also thousands of families uh, that are affected, obviously. How do we make sure that they get a different job and that they don't feel that we as a government uh, ruin not only their livelihood, but also criticize their way of life, their identity. It's a delicate uh, matter. Now, uh, moving uh, to another very good and dear colleague from, from uh, Europe, uh, we're going to uh, Belgium. Minister van der Straßen, Tine, the floor is yours. 
Thank you. Uh, thank you for being here. Thank you for inviting me. Um, I wanted to say to my Polish uh, colleague that it needs, you said it needs to be gradual, and I do agree there is nothing wrong with small steps as long as you have many small steps going in the right direction. And maybe, uh, Dana, I want to take up your point about um, polarizing issues. Uh, in Belgium, we have the nuclear phase out, and it's the same thing. It's people losing jobs because we are moving away from nuclear and we are creating jobs in, in renewable transitions. But it's also, people speak about this in a very emotional way. And that's a real challenge for us. It's a real challenge also for people-centered transitions. And I wanted to use my now one and one minute and 16 seconds to talk about, about change. And huge changes uh, are, are coming and changes that feel look that feel and look normal to us as dedicated policymakers, that feel and look normal to energy experts, but not to the general public. And we need to make sure that people follow. And research tells us that people, they tend to start to school. People tend to overvalue what they have. And when in doubt, people stick to what they know. But what if this no longer works, as is now uh, the case? And that's why I think we like and we love to talk about technical issues, about security of supply, about infrastructures, but we need the same attention uh, to people. And we need in our policies also uh, to design our policy that encourage and promote change, build support for change, and that also change our social norms. And that's why I'm always pleading that we not only need engineers, but we also need behavioral scientists. We need uh, people in social sciences that can help us policymakers not only to create these policies but also to dialogue with our citizens and to create a global community to make this transition work. Thank you. I think that's a very, very um, important uh, point, uh, Tina. I, I like to tell a story about the Danish island of Samsø, which has been uh, carbon neutral for, for almost decades now. And that there's TV crews all the time coming from Japan and South America and the US to show how this island is working. And they want to go and see the wind turbines, of course, and film them. But the manager of the, the transformation side over there takes them instead to visit a farmer and have a cup of coffee with the farmer at his kitchen table, because that's where the, the important decisions were made. That's where the support came from. It came bottom up. So now the whole of, of that island is engaged, and that's really been uh, the success more than the actual technical uh, approach and more than the actual physical wind turbines. So let's, uh, let's move on uh, now uh, to Hungary. Uh, we have uh, State Secretary uh, Steiner with us. Uh, please, sir, the floor is yours. Distinguished ministers, uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great honor for me to participate in this um, highly important panel discussion, and I was very pleased to accept the invitation. Uh, we are living in a world of uh, profound and rapid changes, and this is especially true uh, for the global energy landscape. Renewables are spreading fast, and uh, energy efficient uh, technologies are arising, however, not fast enough to meet the goals of the Paris Agreement. And uh, despite the significant benefits innovative technologies can provide, the transition towards clean energy and clean transition remains one of the greatest challenges of our time. We are facing an increasing global demand for energy and an urgent need to lower emissions at the same time. But we also understand that uh, no successful implemented transition can be done without putting people at its center. Therefore, I very much uh, welcome this discussion. According to our experiences in Hungary, uh, the, the decoupling of economic performance and emissions is key to get citizens on board. And taking into consideration current achievements, Hungary is in a good track compared to 1990, which is a reference year uh, in the European Union, we have managed to decrease our emissions by 32% while maintaining significant economic development in the same time. And I think this, is, uh, this will be also crucial in the future. 
And we are also determined to uh, follow this track uh, by achieving an energy mix uh, by 2030, which enables 90% CO2 emission-free uh, electricity generation. And of course, one of the main objectives to achieve this goal is to phase out coal uh, by 2026, while ensuring a socially just transition for uh, the impacted citizens. And uh, let me also highlight that, therefore, we have just recently joined the Powering Past uh, Coal Alliance. And um, in the spirit of ensuring a people-centered transition, we have a national energy and uh, climate strat strategy with the vision to be clean, uh, smart, and affordable. Clean by increasing the share of low and zero emission technologies uh, in the domestic energy supplies and use energy efficient solutions. Smart by building on the newest technologies in order to provide high quality services at the lowest possible cost. And in the transition of the energy sector, Hungary also aspires to give new business opportunities for innovative uh, enterprises. And finally, affordable by ensuring a diversified supply portfolio and the regulatory environment where the competitiveness of the Hungarian economy and growth of the consumer's welfare are sustainably supported. Thank you very much uh, for your attention. Thank you so much uh, for, for those insights from, from Hungary. And uh, now we uh, move to a different continent. Uh, we are going to Africa, uh, to Kenya. Um, I read uh, in, a, in a recent report from Irina that Kenya's solar workforce is predicted to rise with an impressive 70% between 2019 and 2023. That is, uh, that is very impressive indeed. So uh, it's a pleasure to give the floor to uh, Mr. Zagari uh, Ayeko. Uh, the floor is yours, sir. Thank you, Chair. As you have mentioned, uh, my name is Zachary Yeko. I'm stepping in for our Minister for Energy, uh, Mr. Charles Gatel, who un unavoidably could not be with us, but uh, I'm able to represent him. Uh, uh, the statement from the Minister and from the, the, the Government of Kenya is that Kenya fully supports the principle of sustainable clean energy transition that ensures equitable access to energy services and ensuring no citizen is left behind. So we have included everybody else. And currently we, we, are, we are accelerating access to the rural areas. Uh, we have done very well in this respect by including our members of parliament who represent the citizens all over the country and the citizens all over the country are fully involved in this. Uh, so we fully uh, believe that access to clean, sustainable, reliable, and affordable electricity is very critical. It's a critical enabler for the achievement of the Vision 2030 aspirations. In the, uh, currently, we have about 75% of our installed capacity of electricity coming from renewable energy. And this is currently supplying 92% of, of our supplies to our customers. So which means that 92% of our customers are getting supply from the clean energy. And uh, mainly this coming from geothermal, hydro, and now recently we have wind and uh, solar installations. In the recent past, Kenya has implemented people centered energy access programs. And these include the last mile, last mile means the access to the households in the rural areas and all over the country, connectivity programs, which have enabled the country to accelerate clean rural electrification program from a connectivity rate of about 29% in the year 2013 to over 75% currently. The last mile connectivity program is premised on cross subsidies to make electricity access affordable to the poor households. Electrification of public institutions and community facilities, including schools, health centers, and market, market centers all over the country 
are really going up on a very fast pace. The other strategies which are included under uh, uh, implementation are bioenergy strategies, energy efficiency strategies, conservation strategies. In implementing these strategies, uh, measures are taken to ensure social equity and that no one is left out. Uh, for in the development of the various energy strategies that we have implemented, all relevant stakeholders are involved to ensure inclusivity of all the interests. That's a short statement I have from the Ministry uh, of Energy, Kenya. Thank you, Chair. Thank you so, uh, so much uh, for those uh, important insights from, from Kenya. Uh, now we move to uh, Switzerland. And let me start by congratulating uh, Switzerland for having adopted uh, the long-term climate strategy for 2050. Uh, I'm happy to say that we have State Secretary Benoit Reva uh, with us uh, today. Uh, please, sir, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Minister Jorgensen. Uh, first of all, Federal Council Simonetta Samaruga regrets not being able to join uh, today because of a uh, Federal Council meeting, but I'm pleased to address a uh, message. Uh, as it was mentioned, uh, energy transition will not succeed without people, but let's face it, uh, energy and climate policies are often technocratic, uh, but people will feel the impact of uh, policies and to make sure people will accept them, it is important to consider their needs and worries. Also meaning that people must be convinced of uh, uh, policies, even of uh, unpopular policies, such as uh, carbon tax. Our carbon tax in Switzerland, our carbon tax rate is uh, 103 US dollar per ton. So how did we convince our people? Mainly with three arguments. First, carbon tax revenues are used in a transparent way and they benefit those who reduce their emissions. Concretely, we refund two thirds of the revenues to the population on a per capita basis, the rest goes to a building renovation program. Second, enterprises are given a carrot and stick. The carrot is a tax exemption if they reduce emissions, the stick is a fine if they don't. And third, give people an economy time to adapt and a clear vision. So that's why we introduced a mechanism which increases the tax rate automatically if our emission reductions are not on track. So let me bring these elements to an international level because uh, I believe that we will have to address concern of all countries, advanced and developing, if we want to make an impact at COP26. In 2007, Switzerland presented a, a proposal for a global carbon tax in the context of climate negotiation. No surprise, it did not fly. Nevertheless, I would like to recall some elements which may be of interest. So let me illustrate shortly the case. All countries would levy a very low carbon tax. It would depend on the country's income level. Advanced countries would pay, for instance, $2 per ton, low income countries less than $1. 50% of revenues from advanced countries and 10% from emerging economies would go to an international fund. It would of course need to be fine-tuned, but our original proposal was to use the fund for climate adaptation. But we could envisage using it, at least partially, to buffer the social impacts of the energy transition. Also, international projects under Article 6 of Paris Agreement could help. Switzerland has concluded agreements with Ghana and Peru and is negotiating more to ensure such projects are effective and their impact can be verified. I thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, uh, State Secretary. Uh, no doubt uh, putting a price on carbon, putting a, a price on the pollution, so to say, uh, can be a very important uh, tool. Uh, and uh, I will definitely, for one, be studying what it is that you've done in, in Switzerland uh, to see whether or not it's something that we can learn from. And it is an extremely important and, and timely discussion also uh, uh, to, to talk about whether or not we should have a global 
uh, tax. Probably not something that will be introduced tomorrow, but who knows uh, in time. Now, I think it's uh, about time that we also have our first non-governmental intervention. Uh, inclusion is, is uh, so important, obviously. Uh, so therefore, uh, now we will hear from the youth. Uh, Mr. Uday, uh, global uh, focal point of the SG7 youth constituency. Um, you are also uh, part of uh, the Global Commission on People-Centered Clean Energy Transitions. And I'm glad to see you here today uh, as well. Please, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Minister, Excellencies, and good afternoon from Geneva. I'm happy again to speak on behalf of Global Youths of the SDG7 Youth Constituency of the major group for children and youths. Yes, young people are crucial in driving people-centered energy transitions, more so in ensuring that no one is left behind. But we face quite some such challenges in a bit to achieve this and some of them here. We have a lot of bureaucratic barriers, including complex processes for registration of startups, accounting and obtaining licenses. There's the race to bottom in terms of cost reduction of renewable energy installations, because since local startups and SMEs have little chance to compete with multinational corporations, investments spent on renewable energy projects is transferred abroad rather than reinvested in the local community through financing research, creating jobs and tax payments. There's also a deprivation, especially in the recovery process uh, in the aftermath of COVID-19 of economic stimulus given to other SMEs. This owes to a lot of young startup on renewable energy in especially developing countries, not having all the documents that may be required to access this stimulus. But then in what ways are young people on the ground leading the work on people-centered energy transition? I will share a few of the work of some of the most brilliant youth actions we've captured in our Youth Sustainable Energy Hub. One is Lita of Light in Bangladesh, is a research-based social enterprise providing free of cost, eco-friendly lightning solutions to poor communities, such as coastal areas, hill track areas, islands, slums, and refugee camps in Bangladesh. It develops and distributes easy to make lightning solutions out of locally available materials. Litter of Light runs livelihood projects helping poor communities to learn their technology and start their own micro enterprise on the solarpreneur project. Through the solarpreneur project, they've made around a thousand solar entrepreneurs, including Rohingya refugees in Cox's Bazar. This group has also trained over a hundred voluntary organizations on light making so they can also serve their own localities. They've lit up around 30 localities so far, including slums, coastal areas, and Rohingya refugee camps. Another one is Energy Shift. Through their process, they enable citizens to participate in energy transition by enabling them to invest and co-own a part of solar energy power plant, thus doing good for the environment and making money at the same time, which is a very crucial combination. They just finished a business incubation and pre-accelerator uh, program and received solar impulse efficient solution level. These are just a few of the work, amazing work that young people on the ground are doing. However, more attention needs to be paid to people facing aspects of energy transition. A lot of focus again should be given to the transition of power supply, especially installation of power of solar PV plants on utility and residential scale. With about 3 billion people lacking access to clean cooking, clean cooking and clean heating need to be at the center of energy transition because pollution and cost of dirty fuels directly impact the health and safety of people, in particular women, youth and children. It will require more financial commitment to provide the 41 billion US dollars annually need needed to meet uh, the clean cooking targets by 2030. Currently only one third of that was tracked uh, in high impact countries in Africa and in Asia, according to reports. This will be extremely crucial if we are able to move towards a people-centered energy transition. I'll stop here, I thank you. Thank you uh, so much, uh, Mr. Uday. Uh, many important points. Uh, one that is especially important is that we need the resources, we need the funding, the financing, uh, the developed uh, part of this planet needs to start giving some of the resources that they have promised 
uh, to developing countries. That is that is very important. Now, uh, one of the European leaders that is uh, vigorously working on this agenda and and who is really uh, showing uh, extraordinary leadership is uh, our next uh, speaker, which is uh, European Commissioner Katri Simpson. Katri, the floor is yours. Thank you, Dan. And um, many wise words have been spoken already, so I can only agree that um, energy transition needs some time. And for us, um, this is the target uh, to become uh, a reality is uh, one generation away or uh, 29 years away, because by 2050, Europe should become climate neutral continent. And this net zero is our response to the global climate emergency, but also our growth agenda. A green deal economy means that uh, we will evolve towards cleaner industries, more sustainable business models, new job opportunities. We estimate that um, the green deal can generate up to 1.2 million new jobs um, here in European Union within the next decade alone and uh, up to 2.1 million clean jobs by 2050. So just compare that um, um, right now there are 200,000 jobs currently in the coal sector in the European Union. So um, we know that every modernization uh, process um, comes with disruption and dislocation. Moving to a greener economy means some old ways will be shaken, some local jobs will be lost, some communities will be deeply affected. So um, true climate leadership requires a fair and just transition. And uh, we need to design policies uh, that address the consequences of the transition and uh, help those that are most vulnerable to it. And this means making uh, sure that no one is left behind. And this is the European way towards a fair, just and sustainable transition. Earlier this month, um, I accepted to take an active part in the Global Commission on People-Centered uh, Clean Energy Transition, as I believe we must look at the human side of the energy transition. That's why we created um, in the EU a new just transition mechanism as part of the Green Deal, and it will inject up to 100 billion euros of investments uh, by 2030 in coal and carbon rich uh, regions across the EU. And this targeted instrument uh, will complement uh, Europe's greenest budget in history with at least 30% of uh, total EU expenditure dedicated to green investment. Um, through our long-term budget and recovery funds, we will create um, the conditions for new investments in the regions most affected. Um, and uh, that means also investing um, in training of workers into the jobs of tomorrow, uh, incentivizing new local business, and of course, uh, repurposing land. And, uh, and uh, beyond the investment, we are bringing technical support to regions in need. So uh, since 2018, the EU initiative for coal regions in transition ensures that vulnerable communities are involved in the planning and implementation in their transition. And um, in our view, leaving no one behind is a principle for all countries beyond the EU too. So we have a long tradition of sharing our own experience and uh, we want to support initiatives of third countries who are looking to, to transition to a more sustainable way of living. So, Already now, we have uh, just done this in our own neighborhood with several international partners. We have launched an initiative to help coal regions in Western Balkans and Ukraine um, with 17 coal regions benefiting from our actions. And we are ready to go beyond and cooperate with partners across the globe. And uh, we want to accelerate moving to that zero system globally, but we want to promote uh, the conditions for doing it in a fair and just way. And of course, this means improving energy access and uh, serving the energy needs of the poorest and more vulnerable. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Commissioner. Uh, and now we give the floor to, to somebody that has been an important voice uh, arguing for just transition for, for many years already. Uh, and that is uh, the General Secretary of ITUK, uh, Sharon Burrow. Sharon, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. And I must say this discussion is a very encouraging, Minister, and I thank you all for your leadership. I guess I have three messages today. There's no doubt that uh, 
governments have made a lot of investment already into keeping us going through the uh, through COVID-19 to the best of our abilities. A lot of those were advances in the social contract with support for business and job guarantees and income guarantees and social protection more broadly, including health, and we thank you. I was struck by the South African minister, indeed, uh, earlier this morning about how difficult it is to manage the convergence of crisis we face. But we have no choice on that. And he said that eloquently, that, uh, you know, we have already spent more than $15 trillion on efforts to date, although a fraction of that tragically in the developing world because of fiscal space and debt. But when you look at that $14 trillion, it does worry me that very little of it has actually gone to areas that uh, unless some of the social protections are sustained, will build either sustainable recovery or resilience. So I think that we should be thinking about both public and private investment and how every dollar, euro, unit of currency is actually screened with an ESG lens, has to build the economy, but it must also sustain uh, um, society with uh, rights and social protection and of course it must uh, and equality and it must uh, look of course to climate action so I think there's a big shift that we have to you know be very loud about in terms of all investment but of course for workers recovery and resilience is our very central focus and you know um, we call for a, a new social contract, but three of those elements, apart from equality of incomes, race and gender that we must mitigate, the, the real question is jobs, jobs and jobs, because so many people are without work or are in informal work, now 60% of what is a broken labour market. So we need jobs, but we need them to be climate-friendly jobs. So they've got to come from investment in transition by all sectors, public and private, all industry sectors, and of course energy, as your focus is, is the foundation for that. It's not, um, it's not everything, but it's certainly a foundation. And so they have to be climate-friendly jobs with just transition. And we are very conscious and we're trying to do the research constantly to back you in that every investment in transition is actually job rich because it is about protecting and enhancing jobs and the research shows us that. We of course want to say to you, please do that with two things in mind. One is rights. We can't have a world where people simply don't have rights because it's not the tr that, that breaks the trust, creates despair and we will never do this job without people. And that's why just transition is so important. And of course, uh, universal social protection. We can't build resilience against what we know will be further climate shocks, economic shocks, and of course, uh, um, could even be health shocks. And of course, the intersection of health and climate is now really proven in terms of biodiversity protection and so on. But I wanted to finish by saying the the commitment here to uh, to action and indeed to just transition is really heartening as we get towards COP. But I took another look at the NDCs this morning through our analysis lens, and only 25% have the kind of high ambition we need. We need, not a matter of a competition. If we don't get that ambition, we don't stabilise the planet and it won't be fit, as uh, Franz Timmerman says, for our children um, and indeed will create the kind of conflict none of us want. But then only 20% actually registered social dialogue. Now, you can't build a trusted future if people aren't at the table feeling like they've got a stake in the plan. And then only 12% registered just transition. So we need your support to lift the game here. And clearly social dialogue and just transition are married to each other because you can't have a plan that's about just transition if it's not trusted through dialogue. So I know many of you, I know you champions. I particularly uh, work closely with some of you and we just need to get this job done, but it's got to have people at the centre.
So thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Sharon. Uh, jobs, jobs, and jobs. Really, that that is as simple as as we can put it. But green jobs, of course. Uh, and uh, it is so important that we make sure that the dialogue is 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 always uh, present because making decisions uh, top down, even healthy good decisions, might not work if you don't have the dialogue, if you don't have the support uh, amongst the people that you are affecting. So now uh, we move to our last uh, speaker, uh, uh, and uh, that is uh, Mr. Mohit Bagava, CEO of the NTPC Renewable Energy Limited. I believe that uh, your company is the largest energy conglomerate in India, and you have recently set up uh, a renewable energy subsidy that will focus on green energy and just transition. And that, of course, is extremely interesting. Uh, so uh, we look forward to hear more about that. Please, uh, Mr. Bagava, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Mr. Minister and Honorable Ministers, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, thanks a lot for having me on the panel. It's really an honor for me. Yes, I represent NTPC. NTPC Renewable Energy Limited is a wholly owned subsidiary of NTPC, which is India's largest power utility. And, and I believe uh, setting up of this wholly owned subsidiary by NTPC is clearly a commitment from NTPC to walk down firmly down the path of energy transition and also help our country to achieve that over the next few years. Uh, I'm not sure how many of the things have already been spoken because I heard through this discussion and jobs. Jobs has been the theme. Uh, and we firmly believe that the transition should happen in a manner which is not painful to anyone and should certainly be beneficial to everyone in the long run. So it's just about just transition. It's just about people-centered transition. It's just to ensure that everyone comes out happy and better at the end of all this. The process should be inclusive. It should include health, well-being. So we should provide access to clean health, clean energy, clean air, clean water to every person. And it should focus at the cost of repetition on jobs and leaving no worker behind. So as we look at the people-centered transition, it's also important how to finance it. And I'm happy this point was raised earlier by our friend. Finance remains one of the most important thing for transition to happen. And it's also very important to remember that while the transition across the developed countries would happen much more easily, this is an issue which might actually become a big pain point for the developing and the least developed countries. So we have to avoid increasing the debt burden on, debt burden on the developing world and need to provide access to cheaper long-term financing as well as technological solutions. If I may say so, it's not just the capital cost of transition, it's also the cost of capital, which is important for the transition to happen. And if I may use uh, one of the statements, which I believe Dr. Fatih Barol had made earlier, that one ton of carbon dioxide emitted affects everyone on the planet. I'd just like to add one more, but incidentally, one dollar spent in the developing world will help climate uh, change and energy transition much more than a dollar spent on the developing developed world. So we need to put together our forces. We need to ensure that the financing is available, cheaper financing is available, and we need to put people at the center of the entire transition. Because ultimately, as even the theme says, it's about ensuring people-centered transition. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, sir. And now to uh, formally uh, end uh, this uh, this panel because time is running out. I give the floor back to uh, Minister Mantashi, and thank you so much, uh, all of you from, from me and Copenhagen. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Minister. Um, one, I think there's one thing that was highlighted by Poland, which is not being debated uh, in many forums, that yes, closure of mines, decreasing contribution of coal, but he says, we want to go to nuclear. And there's no debate of whether nuclear is part of clean energy uh, framework. We normally don't mention nuclear at all in talking about clean energy. And I think Poland is raising that issue and must talk about it. Um, and therefore he highlighted as well the importance of 
a period for just transition. Uh, Belgium is raising an issue of renewables, creating jobs, but in developing economies, that is a pie in the sky because manufacturing is not happening in the developing economies. And we get ready products, we construct, and we build wind farms, and we build uh, PV centers, but manufacturing is happening outside of those. And therefore jobs are created somewhere else, Mr. Minister, thank you very much for joining us from uh, Tokyo. But before going to you, uh, Mr. Minister, if I may, only a few days ago.